Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me here today uh, is, you know, maybe one of the few people that has way cooler shirts than me. Um, uh, his, his name is Michael Bungay Stanner. Uh, he's the author of six books, um, which between them have sold more than a million copies. He's best known for the book called The Coaching Habit, uh, the best-selling uh, coaching book of the century and already recognized as a classic. Um, he's got a bunch of other different books. I think last year he launched a book called The, uh, the Advice Trap. He's got a book coming out soon um, that is called How to Begin, uh, which helps people to be more ambitious for themselves and for the world. So um, Michael is like, I mean, definitely top 1% of self-published authors. I mean, you know, we've got Hal Elrod who comes on the show all the time and is a good friend and huge promoter of self-publishing school. And, um, and, and, but I think there's only a handful of folks who have sold uh, over a million copies of a self-published book, and, and he's one of them. So I'm excited for that reason. I think we've got a lot to learn there. But then also, uh, I love this book. Um, so The Coaching <laughs> Habit was a life-changing book for me. Um, for the, those of you who know me well, know that you know I kind of went on this year of leadership and getting better at leadership. And leadership was this big kind of airy-fairy thing that was like, Oh, cool. Let's talk about something else that like doesn't really <laughs> move the needle. Like, and, and it kind of felt like this hard thing to grasp. Mm. Like, okay, I've heard of leadership, but I haven't seen it, or I, I have seen it, but I didn't know that I uh, that I've yeah. seen it, right? And and I just remember reading your book, Michael, and it was a big shift to me. It's like, oh, leadership is coaching. And so think of yourself as a coach, not a leader. Yeah. And that was just such a huge shift because I'm a big college football fan. Dabo Sweeney, Clemson Tigers, all that. And so I'm like, oh, I see how he coaches. I can think of what a coach looks like. I can think of what a coach does, like all those yeah. things. So this is a huge shift. And I've since, I think it's might be recommended in one of my top five leadership books of all time well, video you, and I I've recommended that. it a ton. So very long preamble, Michael. <laughs> great to have you here. Chandler, thank you. I'm excited to be here. You know, I have been a fan of self publishing for, I, I first published my first book probably 15 years ago. And some have sold well and some haven't sold well. And I've learned a bunch along the way, but I love self-publishing as a way of bringing your stuff into the world for a bunch yeah. of reasons. And if you're lucky, <laughs> sometimes you can make a real splash with it. Cause I feel like with the coaching habit, which has sold more than a million copies now, it's like, you know what? It's sold more than a million copies. It's generated probably about $10 million worth of business, probably a bit more in terms of on the back end. It's really changed wow. my life and, and self-publishing wow. did that. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, hey, we'll, um, we'll unpack that, that, yeah. that business building piece a little bit later. Um, first off, why, why did you decide to, to write your first book? Well, you know, I, my grandmother, my dad's mom was a writer. Um, she, she lived in England and I'd always kind of admired that. And I'd always been a book person. You know, I loved reading. I read fast. I read early. I read under the sheets. I read when I wasn't supposed to be reading. So I, I had in my mind around being, I like, I like writing. And, you know, in early days, I'd often write little newsletters and little bits and pieces. And then some 20 years ago, when I um, had just started my own company, I was like, you know what, I... I have an idea for a book that kind of connects with it. It's, it was not a traditional book with chapters and the like. It was a, it was like a self-coaching book. You know, the, you know, the kids flip books where you have a, like a ballerina's head and a scuba diver's body and a soccer player's legs. I thought, you know, I could create something like that, but instead of pictures with words that would provoke people to think differently about a challenge. So I came up with this idea and I went to my local staples and I made a prototype and I wrote it all out by hand. And, you know, bear in mind, this was 2004. So well before self-publishing became easier. And I just got a phone, like, I have no idea how to do this. So it's not even, it's not even printing a regular book. It's, it's complicated. So I kind of forgot about it. And then my cousin one day called me up and said, you know, I love that idea of the book you told me about two years ago. Uh, it, you're not doing it, obviously. So I thought I could do it with my boss and our company. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely doing that. And um, it, it coincided with a, a grandparent dying and leaving me $20,000, which was, is now and was then a lot of money. I was like, okay, I'm going to invest that money in this book. 
and I'm comfortable with never seeing that money ever again, <laughs> you know, because who knows whether this book will sell. So I, I, I did it. We, we eventually sold out the print run. I mean, within a couple of years, we sold out a, an initial 5,000 print run. And I was like, that was good. <laughs> and then I came up with another idea for another book and self-published that. And um, Workman, the New York publisher, found out about it and they kind of bought the rights to that. So that became my first foray into traditional publishing. Then I tried to pitch them my next book and spent five years trying to convince them to buy this book and they just would not, they would not get it. And finally, I thought I'd bluff them. I went, okay, I said, right, look, it's either you or me. <laughs> either you say yes to this book now or we're done because this conversation is killing me. And they said no. I was like, oh man, because my, my <laughs> book with them had published like maybe 100,000 copies, maybe not quite that. And I was like, why wouldn't you back <laughs> the author? But yeah. they didn't. And that was the coaching habit. So that forced me back into self-publishing. And um, that turned out to be brilliant. So I'm very grateful that Workman said no to me because oh, that op opened up doors gosh. in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. That's crazy. Because which one, which one did you publish through them? Um, it's called Do More Great Work. I self-published it as it. a little booklet called Find Your Great Work. And then they took mm -hmm. it and, and said, look, there'll be no work at all. Just We'll just republish it under Do Your Great, yeah. great Work. And that meant mm -hmm. actually rewrite the entire book. So it's, it's, it's a better book for it, but it was more yeah. work than I thought it would be. Got it. So self-published, got a traditional publishing deal, then republished with the traditional publisher for that yeah. book. Um, it, it, was there an advance or anything or why, why, why traditionally publish that one? Um, they, they, they gave me an advance of, I think, 10 or $15,000, which was pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, it felt like, a step into a grown-up world, right? You know, a promise of distribution, a great mm. publisher like Workman is at one of the great, more independent publishers. Um, mm. I emailed Seth Godin, who I knew a tiny bit, and he's like, "Look, if I didn't publish my books with Portfolio, I'd publish them with Workman." And I was like, "This sounds great." And at the time, Peter Workman was alive, and he he called me up and sold me the deals. So I'm like, the, "The guy who founded the company is selling me to me," and it it was. I did get distribution and uh, an understanding of publishing in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, but it also, you know, I realized where I lost control of the book, mm -hmm. what I didn't, I didn't have a rights over the complicated, just, it, it was, I like, turns out I like being in control <laughs> and mm -hmm. moving to a traditional publisher gives you freedom, removes risk, but also removes control. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. And so then, then you try to try to sell them the, uh, on the idea of the coaching habit for five years, they kept saying, <laughs> no, uh, they called, they called your bluff and said, sure, just go do it. Um, yeah. Why were you so compelled to write that book? You no, know, uh, there was a couple of reasons. One is it was an idea I couldn't shake. So I kept coming back to it going, I think I've got something really valuable to teach around this. And the second thing, and I think this is really helpful if you're self-publishing, is I knew how it fit my business ecosystem. Like I knew that even if I sold barely any books, I could use this book as a way of growing my, my training company. So Box of Crowns, my training company sells training courses to big companies, Fortune 1000 companies. And I was like, you know what, even if it, you know, even if I sell up, 500 books and I've got 5,000 books. I now need to use as furniture for a few years. Um, I will still be able to find a way of making those into a marketing tool. So I, 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 I'm actually pretty conservative around risk Chandler. I'm not one to kind of go, I'm happy to lose lots of money. So I really try and figure out what am I, if this doesn't work, what's at risk, what will I lose? And am I comfortable with that loss? And so part of the commitment was like, you know what? I'm comfortable with spending this money because I think I can get it back through training sales, not necessarily book sales. Turns out the book sales went great anyway. And that's, that's super smart. So you're beginning with, I was just taking some notes there. Um, so you're beginning with the end in mind um, and saying, hey, if, even if this doesn't sell a lot of copies, this will grow my training company. What's the upside? a lot of growth there. What's mm -hmm. the downside? Maybe yeah. five, 10, 15 grand all in. 
uh, yeah. for, for self-publishing it. And you said, hey, the upside's way better than the downside. So I'm just going to self-publish this. Well, that's right. And um, one of the things that I love about self-publishing is that I manage it as part of my overall brand. Like I determine the look and the feel and the vibe and the calls to action and the invitations and the come and visit my website things in a way that you just can't with a regular publisher. Um, you know, every time I reprint the coaching habit, um, well, not every time, but over the time I've evolved the call to actions that are throughout the book to say, you know, the first, the first hundred thousand copies, it was all, Hey, I'm Michael. I'm the, I'm the author. It'd be awesome if you gave me a rating on Amazon or online, it, it really helps the book sell. And then after I got to a thousand reviews on Amazon, which I was so excited by, cause that felt impossible. I was like, I don't. I mean, the difference between a thousand reviews and 2000 reviews isn't that much. It's <laughs> like a thousand reviews is already amazing. So I, I changed the call to action and say, Hey, come visit my website. I'll give you the free thing. So I could then grow my community and grow my download and that degree of flexibility and thinking about how does this work within my ecosystem is not one that you get if you go with the regular publisher. No doubt. That's super smart. I mean, I'm, I'm, in the middle of uh, rewriting and republishing my book called published right now. And it's so interesting how that evolves. I mean, it's been five, yeah. six years and it's probably, probably over, I don't know, a hundred, 200,000 copies of that book. Um, but now it's just like, there's so many different things that we have and there's so, and it's the same type of thing, right? It's like, Oh, there's right. something that we could put right here. And so if you're trying to boost that um, reader to subscriber rate, right. It, it, it's it's easy to do so if you go back to it, but that's the beauty of exactly. self-publishing is you can iterate and you can exactly. Iterate. I mean, in the last year, I reckon QR codes have finally started working in a way yeah. that they never did. Like my friend Scott Stratton <laughs> has this thing about ban all QR codes because they kill kittens or something. I mean, he hates hated yeah. them, but now I found with you know going into places and needing to scan stuff for COVID. It's often a QR code where you like scan this and your menu will yeah. pop up and your, and your COVID thing. I'm like, oh, QR codes work. So in this That's new book, I'm now putting QR codes in to allow people reading a print copy to more easily accessible access, uh, access videos and downloads and stuff like that. So, uh, but I'm, no, I'm not going to go back to Workman to try and get them to do that with do more. <laughs> I'm like, I don't yeah. even know who I'd be speaking to or. And they're like, I don't know, it's complicated and it's going to cost us money and what's in it for us? Nothing's in it for them. So, yeah. That's super smart. That's a great idea. I love that idea because, yeah, it used to be you had to have an app and, and it was like, okay, well, I got to have a QR code app. I got to scan it. But it's just now it's so easy and native yeah, and people you, you have to have a know how it works. So yeah. That's interesting. I might try that um, in, the, in the relaunch of, uh, of Published. Why do, you, why do you think this book has sold so well? And specifically the coaching habit. Oh, God, if I had a really good, tight, <laughs> flawless answer to that, I'd be, I'd be wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice <laughs> because, because it, is, it is always a bit of a black box as to why some books really sell well and why, why some books don't. I mean, unless you're super famous and you've, you know, you've been paid $20 million in advance and your, mark, your publishing company's pumping money behind it. So... I put it down to three things. Four, let's say four things. Number one, luck. Like right book, right time, somehow caught, caught a light and, and took off. So just want to say that really loud and clear. Second, um, the experience with Workman and writing and rewriting and rewriting this book. I, I, I literally wrote the full book five times in different iterations before it became the final version of the book. So writing gets better when you rewrite. <laughs> it is just one of the grim truths of writing, which is like, it's miserable writing the sixth draft and it makes your book that much better. And it's miserable writing the seventh draft and your book just becomes tighter and stronger and more cleanly your voice. And um, often in a traditional book run, you're like, if you get three drafts done or four drafts done, you're like, that's amazing. But this process was like five years <laughs> of failed drafts. It wasn't even me iterating on the same thing. I was like, here's how I thought I think I could teach it. And the workman would be like, yeah, that's terrible. And I'm like, yeah, if, you know what? It is actually, that is terrible. That's not a good idea. I mean, I wrote one draft, which is like, here are 168 of my favorite questions. 
And I showed that to them and like, it was a disaster. And I was like, yeah, you know, they're right. That's a terrible book. So that, that all helps. So the amount of writing and rewriting really helped for it. Thirdly, actually, yeah, thirdly, um, one of the things that I do well is I make simple ideas that are complicated. I mean, you were talking about it a bit, Chandler, where you're like, you know, leadership felt broad and abstract and I don't know what it is. Everybody talks about it, but nobody quite defines it. And a friend of mine says that what I do is I thingify stuff. I make what broad concepts tangible. So people go, oh, if that's what you're talking about by coaching, I can do that. If that's what, oh, you know, in the advice trap, the book that came out a, a year or two ago, you know, I'm like, how do I, how do I talk about everybody's inclination to want to jump in and offer up ideas and opinions and solutions? Because we all have it. And so I can you know, the metaphor I came up with, which is the advice monster. So your advice monster looms up out of the dark and kind of comes in and goes, I'm going to add some value to this conversation. And so it just becomes a real thing that is speaking to a psychological pattern. So I think that's the third thing, which is I try and seek simplicity on the other side of complexity. And then the fourth thing was um, I disentangled myself from thinking that the launch was the most important thing. And it's really hard to do. This new book coming out in January, I'm all wrapped around <laughs> the, oh, it's coming out on January the 11th. And there's one part of me going, calm down. Doesn't matter. The launch, just have some fun celebrate the book coming out in the world and then commit to, to a year or maybe two years of championing the book. And I, I, you know, for the coaching habit, I championed that book for two years. I did probably north of a hundred podcasts. It was like two podcasts a week, every week for two years. And I just found ways to get it out into the world. And most authors are so tired by the time their book gets out in the world. And then they use their last gasp of energy to, to launch it and, and try and be on a bazillion podcast and try and hit a mythical list. And then they collapse and they're like, I'm so fed up with this book. I never want to talk about it again. And I'm like, ah, the marketing and the champion of the book is, is the second volume. And the story doesn't finish if you don't get to the second volume. That's so great. And uh, I heard somebody call that one time. It's like the one year launch. Right. I, and, and, and not, not just saying, oh, this is a one week launch. And then I'm going right. to drop this book, never think about it again, but committing to the long-term marketing of the book. And this is, it's so funny. I mean, interviewing hundreds of the best of the top selling authors around the world about how they sell books. I mean, that is the thing that comes yeah. up over and over and over again is right. the people who have perennial bestsellers, they market their book beyond the launch. That's right. And it's one of the freedoms that self-publishing invites you to take because when you go with a regular publisher, even though everybody's gone, you know, they're not that good at marketing. You go, mm -hmm but hopefully they'll be okay for my book. <laughs> and then they break yeah. your heart um, <laughs> because, because they just, they don't care really. You're just one of a book they're putting out in the world and yeah. they're, they're using a venture capitalist model, which is like, as long as one in 10 takes off, I'll be fine. Um, and you're, you know, you're, you're collateral for them. Yeah. And what self-publishing does is it just makes it really clear who's responsible for selling your book, which is you're responsible yeah. for selling your book. And yeah. you can't have a fantasy of somebody else doing it. So you just go, and then you decide whether you're up for it or not, because yeah. it's a fair decision. I reckon Chandler to say, I'm writing this book. So I have a book. Yeah. I don't really need it to sell lots of copies. I just want to be able to point a book on my shelf and go that book. I wrote that yeah. book and you'll be getting it for a Christmas gift from me for the next 43 years, because I've got a lot of <laughs> copies that I haven't shifted. So get used to it. Um, and that's, a, that's success. Like, yeah, wanting to to kind of tick that tick that bucket list mm -hmm. or apocalypse uh, thing. Go, that's it. Love that idea. But if you're like, I need this book to sell, and I want it to sell, I want to reach people, and I want it to drive business, then you've got to commit to the marketing of it. Yeah, no doubt. That that's it's crazy how. Uh, we've never met before and we, uh, we believe in so many of the same concepts and even just that I've never, I, I've been talking about it recently, the venture capitalist model, and I've never heard right. anyone talk about that. So it's so funny that you mentioned that. Hey, you talked about um, kind of um, 
so three over besides luck, three overarching like fundamentals. So yeah. rewriting the book five times to make a better book. It's like making the best complicated book you can. things feel simple. So and broad concepts, tangible, and then even like kind of creating a framework or a name for something or so that mm -hmm. it's memorable, like the, like the advice monster and yeah. then uh, disentangling yourself from the launch and, you know, going beyond launch week to really yeah. launch year committing to a long-term uh, 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 marketing plan with the book. What would you say if we're, so these are like kind of fundamental underlying things. If we were to like bubble up to the top, to the surface, what would you say are like top two or three things tactically that's mm. worked well to sell books. And, and so whether it's during launch or yeah. it's dur during your one year launch. I think the thing that I did that felt smartest was I reverse engineered who I, I sent early copies of the books to. So this is what I mean by that. Like I'm, I'm enough of a C list author that I get random books sent to me. I just got a book sent to me today by HBR, something on project management, something that I know nothing about and I'm not at all interested in, but I'm on a list for HBR and they sent me a book. So it's cost somebody 40 bucks, the book and the mailing to send it to me, for me to go, who can I give this book away to? Cause I don't want it on my shelf. And you know, it's, it's a bit random. And occasionally I get emails from PR people going, Hey, you know, hi there, because there's no name, blah, blah, blah. It's got this new book. Would you be interested to have them on your podcast? I'm like, which podcast is that? Is that the one that I stopped doing five years ago and I'm still on your list? So there's just this waste of energy in terms of how people reach out and kind of connect. So here's what I did. Um, well, here's what I'm doing. I'll give you a, a very specific example of something that's happening right now. So my book is called How to Begin, Start Doing Something That Matters. It's about how do you focus on finding a worthy goal, something thrilling, important, and daunting that taps into your ambition for yourself and for the world. So that comes out in January. A friend of mine is a guy called Oliver Berkman. He has just got a new book out in the world called 4,000 Weeks, and it's his take on time and time management and what do you do with this limited amount of time on this planet? So it is different from my book, but it is thematically aligned. Like we got, we got a certain amount of stuff, spend it well. <laughs> this is it. You get one go around of this. So I hired somebody on guru.com and I said, please find out all the podcasts that Oliver was on over the next uh, over the last three or four weeks um, and find out the top 15 rated articles written about his book. And then I drafted a, a template email um, which says, dear Chandler, Oliver Berkman was a guest on your podcast, blah, blah, blah. He's fantastic. And he's talking about 4,000 weeks, the great episode. I've got a new book out coming out, blah, blah, blah. Oliver Berkman says, because Oliver's written a, a blurb for me about the book, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to be a guest on your podcast. Is there a way I could send you a copy, a pre, you know, an, an electronic copy of the book so that you might see it? And de definitely there's still a failure rate. Like a bunch of people never return the emails. A bunch of people go, no, we're looking for interesting guests. <laughs> their template. I got one today. Thanks for your inquiry. You know, we're fully booked. We're always on the lookout for interesting guests, but we're fully booked for you. Sorry. I was like, God, man. It was like insult to injury. You could have just said, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not interesting enough. I'm like, God damn it. I've been on Brené Brown's podcast. But anyway, so it's a much more targeted outreach. And it means that I'm not sending anybody a book until they've gone, yeah, all right. I'm interested in taking a look at that rather than the randomness. And if you... If you pick four different authors who have kind of sister books to yours and you hire somebody at not a whole lot of money to do that research for you pretty quickly, you then have a targeted hundred person list who have a chance to champion your book. That's so smart. So smart. I love that. Anything else that you've seen that's, that's worked particularly well to move copies, sell books? Well, I, I, my, I, you know, five years ago, I did a lot of podcasts and that was helpful. It, I'm not quite sure that podcasting is quite the power it used to be. 
because there's been this kind of pre-Cambrian explosion of podcasts. I mean, you know, three of your five relatives have started a podcast in the last two weeks. So it's like, okay, there's a lot of low grade podcasts out there. And I do think that if there's a way for you to talk, do a tiny bit of research to find out what's the real quality and what's the real reach of this podcast, it, it's, it's now worth being a bit, a bit of discrimination as to what you say yes to and what you say no to. Um, so I think, I think podcast is a, is, a, is a maybe around that. And then I've really been trying to think about how I try and sell a lot of books in a single go rather than one book, one at a time. Because obviously, everybody who's listening to this already knows, try and build a list because a list is your best bet to have a relationship. Social media doesn't really sell a whole lot of books for the most part because people don't have a relationship with you, even if they do see your tweet flip by. Um, so a list is your most valuable resource for, for connecting. And if you have a list, if you don't have a list yet, start yesterday. If you do have a list, keep growing it and nurturing it and building it because there will be a time when they become your main audience for a one-to-one -one sale for a book. For my list, you know, I, I watch people who kind of offered specials. Buy one book and you get a book. Buy five books and you get a book and a thing. Buy a hundred books and you'll get a book, a thing, and one of my children. Buy a thousand books and I will move and I will build a house for you. Kind of like these kind of like, big bonuses to try and push um, bulk book sales. And I just looked at myself and I went, there's basically two people in the world I would trust enough to bulk order a book that I have never seen before. I'm like, even authors who I normally like, I'm like, Dan Pink. I'm like, I love three out of five of Dan Pink's books and two of them I find underwhelming. And I don't want to have accidentally bought a hundred books of the underwhelming Dan Pink book. So I just don't, <laughs> I just don't trust. I, I, I want to know that if I'm bulk buying a book, I'm, I'm buying a brilliant book. So with my list, which isn't a very big list, my goal was to try and move people from buying one book to buying two, two books. Because if I can find an upgrade where I say, look, if you buy two books, you'll get access to this course which I've shot for you, it's normally worth a hundred bucks. They're like, honestly, I'd risk 20 bucks to get a hundred buck upgrade on a course. And if I can move 10,000 people on my list from buying one book to buying two books, that is a really great initial bump for how I think about launching the book. So yeah. I, I think that kind of psychology of human beings, I'm like, look, some people like me, I'm going to just try and get them to buy two books. That's smart. And you're increasing your viral coefficient, right? Where you're yeah. turning one book into multiple purchases. And even, even like the tar, because it is a business book and it's targeted at leaders or CEOs, there's, there's a natural viral coefficient there where you're selling mm -hmm. into a leader that then like me, that then buys for his whole right. team and then does book clubs and does all that stuff. So that's smart. Well, that, that, is, that is one of the reasons that coaching habits been so successful is yeah. people buy it for people, people buy it for yes. teams, people buy it for people. I, I, I hear a lot. I loved your book. I bought it for at least X number of people. I'm like, you're yep. awesome. Thank you. So it's a, it's a buyable book for others. And is there anything that you've done to friction or like grease the wheels of that happening? Or is that just by the, by the nature of the content and quality of the book, would you say? It's, it's honestly mostly organic. Um, yeah. I've only just start cause I'm a bit slow. I only just started advertising on Amazon in a way of trying just to, to bump sales a little bit around that. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I, I hired a, a, some people to help me with that because I don't know anything about advertising and I don't really want to know anything about advertising. And they tried out a whole bunch of things and none of them really worked except for the automatic Amazon ad placement. So the algorithm sort of figures out what to show the ads next to. And it's not always books and it's not always leadership books. And it's not always coaching books. And that's the thing that is consistently returning a good return on investment for, for me. Interesting. But I shot yeah. videos, I did 
text ads yeah. or done and none of that stuff actually i i kind of try to connect it with certain authors like if you love Brene brown you'll love michael bungay's daniel and none of that worked in a way that was profitable yeah hey, i've got a couple nitty-gritty um marketing questions i was on your um, book page earlier today um and i saw you added a video um which and then i think it's something that so many people sleep on is you know, we always say it's like someone's going to go on your book page for two seconds and then leave or for a mm. minute and a half and then buy. So yeah. how do you keep them on the page? Photo reviews, video reviews, interesting things. So you did, you did two things. And so I'll ask on both of them. One, there's a, there's a featured product video, which yep. I thought it was great. 50 seconds. It connects. I knew you before I knew you even coming on this interview, right? Cause I watched yeah. that 50 second video on your Amazon oh, great. page. I'm like, Oh, this guy's interesting. He's funny. He's charismatic. Maybe I'll, if I hadn't read the book, maybe I'll buy this book. Right. I'll take and just then, one of those, but all three. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but this, so you did th that. And then there was one other thing. And so I'm curious how, how you did both of these, um, things. But the other thing was, it says from the publisher, and then you've got kind of this infographic thing, which is yellow, it stands out. It's, it's an embed for the next book. Yeah. Um, and, and for the advice trap and all that, but it's kind of just makes it fun and interesting. What was the thought process behind doing both of those things? And did you yeah. have to unlock either one of those features by selling a certain amount of copies of the book? Or is that just yeah. something that was native to Amazon? So this is on the Amazon page, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, your Look, book page. Th that's a, I think that's a, that's a relatively new, like about a year old, or maybe two years old thing called Amazon A plus. And you'll see that increasingly because I think they've unlocked that or they've increased the people who are allowed to do that. So you've got all the normal tech stuff, which is the kind of the sales page and the blurbs that you've created. And then you've got these kind of design, colorful visual things that, that the author has a lot and the, the publishing company and the author has a lot more control over because honestly, as I understand it, Chandra, you'll know this better than me. You write a, you write a, a, a product description of your book and you post it somewhere and it populates all of the sales pages for Barnes and Noble and for all the Amazons and for bookshop.org. And basically it, they all draw from the same basic, place to do the scrape book, which is why you want to work on that really well, because it's hard to change and it's, it's out there in the world everywhere. But with Amazon, you also have this option of the A plus thing is what I believe it's called, where you get to kind of design your, your thing. And I think people are still figuring out how best to use that. So if I'm an author, and I'm going to be doing this myself. I'm going to be poking around all of my favorite authors to go, Who's doing what? Because the where people all started was, I'm going to put fancy name blurbs up there. So people kind of go, oh, oh Susan Kane or Chandler Bolters blurb my book. But, I, but my hypothesis is authors care a lot more about blurbs than readers do. Authors kind of go, oh, look, I've got 87 blurbs. My book must be awesome. And if you're a reader, you're like, okay, dude, you've got a lot of blurbs. Congratulations. You've got your friends to write some stuff for you. I need one or two to prove that it's okay. And then that's yeah. all I need. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in thinking of that colorful call out as a, you've got to think of it as a marketer, which is like, yeah. how do you sell medicine? You know, to use the Don Miller phrase, Don Miller of story brand, people buy medicine. So for me, people aren't going to buy your book, particularly if you're in the kind of nonfiction and self-help business thing, which is where I, I spend most of my time, unless they understand the problem that it's solving. And so as I think about um, my new book, you know, I'm like, I've got a number of lines that are rattling through my head. Don't live a life, don't have a life half lived. Like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, how do you find the right project, the right job, the right next thing to live a fully, a fully realized life? And none of these are right, but I'm like, I want people to glance at that because I've got two seconds <laughs> and I want them to go, oh, this book might be something that would be helpful for me. Nice. And you're drawing them in, keeping them on the page. 
Super yeah. smart. Well, hey, man, time is fine. We're, we're, we're right oh. at about time here. Um, a couple, couple final questions I have. Um, oh, man, I got about seven. I'm, I want to ask. <laughs> um, it, just maybe we'll go a little bit of a lightning round. You mentioned 10 million from, mm. from your book. That's crazy. Is, is the lion's share of that royalties? Is the lion's share of that business through consulting? Is it half and half? How, yeah. how do you monetize? It's, um, I can point to five people who have picked up the book, called my training company, and we've ended up having multi-million dollar relationships with them. So yeah. one of the things that I spend many years talking to myself about is like, Michael, you're not in the business of selling books. You're in the business of selling training. Don't get too caught up in how many books have I sold? Because honestly, if I can sell a thousand books to the right people, that's a hundred million dollar business. Um, and where do I choose to put my time? So uh, believe me, I love, I love selling a million copies of the books and I love the royalties. That's kind of bonus money for me. It's yeah. like really surprising, but it's all about the people I wrote the book for. A key number of them have gone, come on into my company and change our company for us. Cool. And then you've got your upcoming book, um, How to Begin. Um, tell us about that book and what are you doing differently to market that book? Maybe from what you've done from, from past books. Yeah. So um, the, the two things I'm doing differently. One is I'm reaching out to organizations and going, Hey, you hired me as and my company for training before I'll trade you a workshop for buying a bulk number of books. So um, I've got enough people who I know who might go, yeah, sure. You know, we know that you're a really expensive speaker. <laughs> we can buy some books instead of paying your full fee. That feels like a bargain to us. The other thing I'm doing is, um, again, Don Miller was the person who I looked at and stole this idea from. I'm in January, I'm running a conference with me, Whitney Johnson, who is a business book author, and Apollo Ono, who is a famous ice skater from the Winter Olympics, uh, all of whom have books coming out around about January. Entry to, the, to this live event is one book. So what that means is each of us will sell to our lists and our followers to go buy a book and you'll get access to this event. But um, access to additional content, kind of an upgrade, means you have to buy all three books. And the idea of that is you don't cannibalize your own sales and marketing to your list, but you potentially invite a percentage of your list to buy other people's lists. And so hopefully there's a cross-fertilization that happens between the, the three of us and we give each other a chance to not just go on and on and on about our books to our lists for the three months, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. It's like, come to my conference. These are the amazing people who are here. Entry is just a book. Mm, nice. That's cool. That's smart. Gosh, I could ask so many different questions. Uh, Michael, this has been awesome. Uh, Thank you. Two, two, two parting questions. And what would be your parting piece of advice um, for someone who's thinking about or about to write their first book? I would decide whether you want a book as a trophy or a book as a business thing. Both of them are uh, totally legitimate decisions. But if it's a business thing, I'd be going, how do I think about the marketing of this book as I'm writing it? And how do I potentially weave ways that this book will be marketed or become more attractive into the very writing of it? Love it. Um, Michael, where can people go to find out more about you, your books, to pre-order the, uh, I don't know, we're probably too far out to pre-order uh, the, the next book. How you, can, begin, you can get it in a few places, but the best place to go is mbs.works. Um, that's my website, www.mbs.works. And you'll see book pages and you'll see free stuff and you'll get onto my list and then you'll be swept into this deep desire to buy the new book. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for it. New Thanks, book Chandler. coming out. I think it's January, 2022. Yeah. January 11th. January 11th. Two, two, uh, one, one, one. Oh, two, two, one. Well, that's, yeah, that, is it's that, all is very that interstellar, Australian right? Day? Is, that, <laughs> that, is that the Canadian date? Is that, <laughs> oh man, Michael, thank you so much, man. This has been awesome. My pleasure. Thanks, Chandler. Thanks for having me.